By the late 1970s, the Mexican grey wolf called the Lobos were believed to be completely gone from the wild in the United States. Under the Endangered Species Act, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, together with the Mexican government, began efforts to save the lobo from extinction. A new era dawned for the Mexican wolf when one female and four males were captured alive in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico, the last five lobos known to roam in the wild. The captive breeding program was then established, saving the lobo at the very last moment. For the first time in almost 30 years, the mountains were greeted by the howl of the wolf. I am wolf, a Mexican gray wolf. I am nature, I am balance. I am a keystone species that keeps nature's beauty in perfect harmony. I am the deer that can jump so high and the elk that is strong and proud. I am the river and the forest. the mysterious and the magnificent. I speak for all wolves, as we have a deep and inherent communication with nature and all its inhabitants. At night our spirits sing, soaring with the winds above the mountains and the trees. When we sing, our songs can be heard across lakes and throughout forests. In the mountain meadows surrounded by granite guardians and green forests, we live as our ancestors have done for thousands of years. This is our home our songs, and our land. It's still the law to recover species teetering on the brink of extinction. And in this case, you've got the rarest and most critically endangered land mammal in North America completely eradicated from the United States and redu reduced to a handful in Mexico that were live captured and pulled from the wild. You can't get closer to extinction, to forcing an animal off this planet than reducing it to one female left on the landscape. And that's the story of Mexican wolves.
This is also the story of the amazing people who dedicate their lives to save the Mexican wolf from extinction, ensuring the majestic lobos of the Southwest forever have the right to be wild. One of the most significant problems facing this program has been the inability to release genetically valuable animals. That's a problem for Mexican wolves because of the limited gene pool and the need to get full representation of the lineages back into the wild to reduce the effects of genetic inbreeding. Without having resilient populations of sufficient size and genetic integrity, an isolated population of, of low numbers could be wiped out in a matter of years. I think those lessons learned in the earlier years of the program were extremely valuable, but they were hard-won lessons. You know, it resulted in the loss of genetically valuable and, in some cases, irreplaceable animals. We're trying to figure out something that's workable, you know. And it's the knowledge that is available now and the relationships that are in place, I think, are sufficient to put this program back on track. And, help these animals find their way back into the landscape in a way that ensures they'll be here for a long time. For many thousands of years, Mexican wolves roamed the southwest as well as, of course, adjoining Mexico. In the 19th century, western settlers brought their cattle on the open range, and at the same time, our pioneering society was gunning down the animals that the wolves relied on. The buffalo, the elk, their populations crashed. The wolves lost their natural prey, so naturally the wolves preyed on the livestock. What the livestock owners did is they organized for state-sponsored bounty. The last wild wolf was killed in southern Colorado near the border with New Mexico. When the Endangered Species Act became a law at the end of 1973, the Fish and Wildlife Service knew that they were very close to losing the Mexican wolf to extinction, which had been their long-standing goal. With this new law, they had new marching orders, which is to save this animal from extinction. And they sent down one of their experienced wolf trappers in the Sierra Madres of Mexico. Between 1977 and 1980, he was only able to capture six wolves. One of these animals died in his trap. Of the remaining five wolves, four of them were male, and only one of them was female. She was given the name Nina by her handlers. The female that was captured was pregnant at the time, and that female's first litter had only one female pup in it. And one pup died from that litter, and it was the female. did manage to get that female pregnant. And all of the Mexican wolves that we know of in the world today stem from that last female, plus two other pairs of wolves that had been captured separately and were later interbred with those last three wolves. Every single Mexican wolf that we know of today stems from those last seven survivors.
wolves have families just as human beings have families. There is alpha male and alpha female, which are the typically the, the two parents in the pack. Uh, they, of course, have pups. Oftentimes, the pups who have been around for a year and are halfway to adulthood will stick around with the family even as new pups are born. But as, as the family grows, uh, eventually uh, the younger wolves will set out on their own and try and find a mate and establish a family of their own. Wolf recovery was a new frontier when the department decided to move forward in a leadership role, balancing the needs and interests of hunters and livestock producers and landowners as well as conservationists. The Mexican wolf is listed under the Endangered Species Act as non-essential experimental, allowing greater management flexibility. I've been involved in the recovery of the Mexican wolf now for 24 years. And I ran the program that resulted in wolves being reintroduced into this area back in the 1990s, was the beginning of it. It's still going on today. It's a boy. We have many partners in the uh, Mexican wolf recovery program. We're working closely with the Arizona Game and Fish Department the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services, Forest Service. Oh, what a bum. 32 zoos or wildlife breeding centers uh, all throughout the United States and in Mexico, raising Mexican wolves for us in captivity. The wolves are just about gone. They're right here. Non-government organizations have uh, provided support in various ways. And the initial recovery plan was a joint U.S.-Mexico recovery plan. There's a very historic effort between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Mexican government to try to um, capture the last few remaining wolves and bring them into captivity. We've come to a point where we can actually put these animals back in the wild, and that's an incredibly exciting moment in history for all of us. In March of 1998, 11 pioneers of the rarest and most unique species of gray wolf in the United States were released into the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area in Arizona, beginning their historic journey, the journey to recovery. Well, we'll be uh, monitoring uh, these animals with both from the air and from the ground to see if uh, we can determine if they're uh, learned to kill on their own. They all have radio collars. Uh, they'll be finding a den location. We'll be using monitoring to determine uh, if uh, pups have been born. Restoring the wolf to the ecosystem is very personally rewarding because it's, it's making something whole again. I've personally been involved in it for over seven years, uh, working for this day, and it's a great feeling. It's a wonderful act of restoration. I think it talks to the human spirit, to our ability to live on this landscape uh, in harmony with God's creation. We are directed by the Endangered Species Act to recover endangered populations. We got to be good managers and, and conservationists with all our wildlife. The field team is responsible for monitoring the wild wolf population um, on the ground. My specific team is involved with monitoring the wolves in Arizona. We trap and collar wolves. We monitor the numbers of packs that we have. We also um, investigate uh, what types of prey that they're selecting. Well, recovering an endangered species is not easy. It takes a lot of commitment, hard work, and dedication from a lot of individuals and agencies. Most of it takes place on the landscape, trying to learn more about, you know, the biology of these animals, how they're utilizing the landscape. We 
go from you know our end of year helicopter count and operation in January into denning season. Uh, that'll help us better document um, pup production. We do a lot of surveying, looking for tracks, scats, um, using remote cameras and some hair snaring techniques to try and document any uncollared wolves. We come up with a minimum population count. Here's a, here's a track right here. You can see the front T toes and the claw marks here and the toes on the on the side but there's the the whole tracks right right here we're in the middle of our january counts now so we'll have a updated minimum count for this year and we're really excited um, about those the potential for that number i think our wolves have been very successful in the wild we have several alpha animals that are breeding right now and we don't know their genetic background. We know they're pure Mexican wolves because their offspring we've been able to catch and test. But since the population was bottlenecked so bad, genetics is very important to uh, know. Alpha animals that continually inhabit one territory, colors that need to be replaced, those are the animals we like to get. Copter 6, 107. The spotter plane will get out and locate the wolves. The, and they will radio back a location. This is the track of the fixed wing aircraft that's tracking pack locations currently. We will have everything set up in the helicopter, uh, safety harness, uh, my dart gun, the telemetry receiver, and we'll all be situated to go out and fly that location and look for those wolves. Okay, we're first. waiting yeah. for a location to get the Elkhorn pack. We're, we're gonna go and try and capture the female that's with uh, the male in the Elkhorn pack right now. She needs a, a collar replacement. the color that was easy to see I'm gonna do a temp real quick 104.4 all right that's a good temperature I'll I'll put it up over your head okay all right
Got it. All right, head yeah. down. Downhill. Helicopters this way. Follow me. Go to the helicopter and go around the front. bring them back we we have hands on them just to make sure that they're breathing okay to show or to check and see if their temperature is stable Yeah, you can just set it down. She's Jeff, good. where was the dart? It bounced off of her back. I mean, every time we handle a, a different wolf, it's a unique experience. Yeah. They're all very different behaviorally, and you can tell, you know, some of them apart. Okay. Um, just by their looks. That's a pretty minor one. It looks pretty good. We try to uh, maintain uh, active functioning radio collars um, on the two alphas at minimum within a given pack. But we do like to also collar uh, yearlings and pups of the year so that we can document dispersal and new pack formations. Uh, one of the drugs I gave her is reversible. A lot of wear. Not a lot of wear at all. Mild tartar. Yeah. Mild wear. Currently, every wolf on the landscape is wild born, having pups every year is a good sign of this ecosystem being able to sustain them. The effects of the darts that we use on the wolves will last between three and four hours, but they'll start waking up after an hour. But we'll hold them a little longer until they're fully awake uh, before we release them back into the forest. Working with wolves has totally enriched my life. They have a place. All predators, not just wolves. prey for Mexican wolves in this area is elk. These wolves are really particular in what they what they take, you know. Every time I've been on a wolf kill, most of them I've found were old and teeth are worn down clear to the gums, you know. And I really investigate. I uh, do a little necropsy on the animals. Wolves can, you know, pick and choose by testing animals. If they come across an animal that's lame or diseased, you know, they can smell it, they can see it. I'm gonna go up this uh, big lake lookout to see if I can hear anybody from up there. So I'm currently uh, on the 24, heading down to the 25, and I was gonna wrap around listening. If you get something from the lookout, let me know and we'll head directionally that way and meet up with you. That sounds good. We'll be sure last on 25-4. Well, uh, we just heard from uh, the Arizona field team leader, uh, Jeff Dolphin, and he's located the blue stem pack. We might be able to go in and get a visual and uh, possibly a count on the pack. Wolves, they like to travel straight line distances, so if they're on these roads, you'll find tracks on the insides of these turns, and then they'll go down the road here, and when they see the next turn, they'll start heading towards the inside of that turn, so they're very direct line travel. They don't wander around like dogs do. Yeah, they travel like race car drivers. Currently, we believe there's 
uh, up to 10 animals. Uh, that includes uh, alpha male and female, um, some yearlings, and then also uh, pups of the year. And I was looking for the blue stem pack here. Now this pack of wolves being this far north is unusual, so we kind of don't know what's going on, if it's a territorial kind of dispute thing or if they're actually pushing in and trying to take over this area, which is which is really weird because the, these guys, they've been in, in their old territory since about 2002. Look around here for tracks and see if, uh, if we find anything right here. So it appears that we're hearing five of the seven uh, radio collared animals in this pack. There's some bald eagles here, so I wonder if there's something dead up here. There's the elk tracks here. There's lots of wolf tracks here going both ways up and down the road. Looks like it could be our wolves. One, two, three, four. This one, I'm pretty sure it's a pup. There's possibly five pups with this pack. It's significant because they've broken from that that straight line pattern. So for them to, to kind of mill around in here, there's something interesting in here that caught their attention. You can see here the little traces of blood. Now it comes in a more sort of linear fashion, so there appears to be a, a nice blood trail, uh, highly suggesting that uh, they recently made a kill. Maybe, maybe they were trying to get an elk. We've had all these tracks on this road up here, and we have these ravens flying. So I think there's a dead animal just over here on the other side of this meadow right here. Gonna go see if we can find it and what it is. So you see the broken branches through here. This animal, this is being chased through here. That's why there's these broken branches. What happened is they were down in here as we approach, they're moving away from us, um, okay. which is typically what happens um, when you're trying to get close to wolves. Scavengers, such as eagles, foxes, ravens, vultures, and bears, thrive on the remains of a wolf kill. Riparian areas in the southwest are absolutely critical. They're where uh, upwards of 90% of wildlife can be found. The wolves play a critical role in regulating the animals that eat the vegetation. So when you have wolves removed from a system, their natural prey becomes much more abundant. The elk like to sit around in our rivers and defecating in the river and graze the vegetation down to almost nothing. This is the Gila River, the high headwaters of the Gila River. So here's what's left of the once mighty Gila River. Completely devoid of riparian vegetation. You can see these are the characteristics of an elk. So there's a lot of active elk use in this area right now. We need wolves to keep them out of this riparian corridor, to keep them naturally scared and moving and not just staying in here because they'll come right in here and 
browse all the riparian vegetation away. That has an incredibly severe effect on the water that we drink and use downstream becomes polluted from all the, the animals that are eating in the river and defecating in the river. When the wolves are present, they chase those ungulates and they keep them out of the rivers. And what that does is it allows the river vegetation to rebound and recover. It also is beneficial for the fish that need the vegetation to shade the river and keep the stream cool. That just has a cascading effect down the system for animals that require that vegetation. Well, Mexican wolves are part of this wild landscape that we're in. They, they evolved in an arid area. Uh, they're smaller than other gray wolves. They're crucial to the balance of nature. They're part of the reason that the deer are so alert, that the, the uh, bighorn sheep can, can leap so gracefully from cliff face to cliff face without falling to their deaths. So the wolves and other carnivorous animals culled the ones that weren't so fitted to their, their ecosystem and didn't allow them to pass on their genes. So we can credit the wolf with a lot of the beauty that we see in this area today. It's pretty amazing when you study wolf ecology to learn just how much they're responsible for. We're more or less between two pack territories with uh, Maverick just to the southwest of us and Blue Stem just to the east of us. We're in the middle of rendezvous season now with at least 21 packs and 50 wild born pups that have survived since denning season. Rock outcroppings like this, particularly over a drainage, are, are pretty typical for wolf den locations. Well, here's a little gift from the Lobos. This is a convincing wolf scat. You can see in here we've got some bone fragments. And it's the right, right size, shape, diameter, good location, wolf occupied area. Seeing signs like this you know, certainly could indicate you know, pups in the area. And they should be getting out and moving around about now. I mean, this is their first exposure to the world, so they're just out testing things, you know, watching their parents learning how to beat wolves. This scat is more typical of a, of a cat scat, in this case either a small cougar or a large bobcat, but you can see how it's segmented, kind of chunky like that. This scat is one we picked up, you know, real near, very near where we found the wolf scat just down the trail. You know. One of the benefits of uh, hiking in a multi-predator system. So this here's a, a stump left over from a beaver cutting. Beavers are also ecosystem engineers and bring with them profound positive changes throughout the ecosystem. This particular area, one of those benefits just happens to be the return of Mexican wolves. Well, it's not surprising we're finding so many bones and tracks in this area. We've got a side drainage off here to the east and looks like another drainage just off to the west. So this is kind of a confluence of activity for critters moving across the landscape from wolves to mountain lions and bears. And who could blame them, you know? It's not a finer place in the west. Well, because of the scats and, and bones and tracks, I think uh, this would be a good place to set up a few of the motion sensor cameras, get a better idea of what's happening here. So I'll probably come back down with the boys later this week, do a little camera trapping. The 
is the Mount Baldy Wilderness, and it's one of the most beautiful and spectacular landscapes anywhere. It's also very sacred to my two sons and I, as this is where we take our annual backpacking trip, and it's really as good as it gets in terms of fatherhood. Right now we're just walking back down this trail to see if we can find any wolf tracks. Well, that's a big wolf track. <laughs> that's a very large wolf track. Uh, but remember the difference between cats, cats and dogs. Okay. Yeah. All right, what's the difference? Um, with a wolf track, you can draw an X across the toes over the, the big pad right here. Draw an X across here and here. But with a jaguar track, it's more of a track like a three and then Straight a up. paw. Yeah. The need for close monitoring of wolf behavior really isn't there as it was at the beginning of the program. A lot has been learned about how they establish territories and utilize the habitat. Our strong preference is to place greater emphasis on non-invasive monitoring techniques such as the use of motion sensor cameras, getting better at tracking using hair snares. Okay, this is the non-invasive black attack motion sensor camera for um, tracking wolves and other animals. You really can't detect them at night, so there's no negative impact on wildlife. So this is a great form of monitoring that can help guide wildlife management and help livestock producers take precautions to reduce conflicts between wolves and livestock. They can be particularly helpful for documenting you know, juvenile wolves or dispersing wolves or wolves that are not radio collared. Well, it takes pictures if something moves this way. All right, so this is more like a black bear than a Mexican wolf. All the Mexican wolves we have today came from a breeding founding population of only seven animals. Seven animals. That, that's like within a wink of becoming extinct. So. There were three females and four males and three different breeding lines uh, involved. One of those lines we call the McBride lineage that was the only certified lineage of Mexican wolves because they had a known origin from the wild. That population was just had three founders, one female and two males, and we considered that the genetics of that population to be so bottlenecked that we were looking for ways to improve that. Well, it had long been known that there were other Mexican wolves in captivity. There was a line called the Ghost Ranch line that came from the last male wolf captured alive in the United States in 1959 in southern Arizona. Paired with a female that was purchased by a tourist in Mexico and transported across the border in the saddlebag of a motorcycle in 1960. Folks in Mexico had taken these pups from a wild den and sold them. He bought one. So he gave it to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in Tucson. They had that male from 1959 in captivity. So eventually that female matured and those two bred and that became what's called the Ghost Ranch line. There was another line of wolves that was known to exist in the Aragon Zoo in Mexico City. They were called the Aragon Line. So in the mid-1990s, I asked a group of the most renowned canine geneticists in the country 
to evaluate the genetics of animals to determine their purity. So we had the McBride line as a standard for what a wild Mexican wolf should look like. Several scientists came together and they subjected all these three breeding lines to various genetic testing and discovered that the uh, Ghost Ranch and Aragon wolves were actually pure Mexican wolves. Based on that information, then we asked the captive breeders to start merging those lines to give us more gene diversity. That was our first boost in solving this problem of uh, a very limited base of genetic uh, diversity. So she gets in a box to stay. Go in a box. There you go. Okay. The Species Survival Plan is a federal recovery plan, and it's by national. It involves a whole network of facilities it's like the Wolf Center and many zoos. It's established so we can create viable populations and safeguard any sort of genetic integrity in captivity for possible release into the wild. Rebecca, what do you know about this wolf? He was the one that was released with a pregnant female and then left her, which is unusual. Well, was he caught again after release? Because he left the boundaries of the, um, of the release area. Okay. And he was born in captivity? Yes. Uh, yeah, he was wild very briefly. All of the participants in the Species Survival Plan, uh, so it's U.S. Fish and Wildlife, a lot of zoos, people like us, they get together every year when we're going to be looking at the stud book, all of the Mexican wolves in captivity, and also the genetics of the wolves in the wild. We're looking to breed animals with the lowest inbreeding coefficient. One of the unusual measures that uh, the program takes is actually looks for the future to use um, some of the wolves long after they're gone, after they've passed away, uh, so they can still contribute uh, to the, uh, the recovery of their species. With the older female wolves, we'll actually spay them uh, in order to save a species. We remove their ovaries and then we put their ovaries on ice and we send them to St. Louis Zoo where the reproductive specialist, Sherry Asa, she'll actually extract all viable oocytes or eggs from these ov ovaries and they freeze them so they can be used for in vitro fertilization uh, in the future. As soon as the males come to be breeding age, um, they'll actually bank their genetic uh, information as well. These Mexican wolves, they're really a part of something much bigger than their pack or the facilities that house them. And I hope on some level they really understand that they're really an enormous contributor to the survival of their rare species. And that's a big ask. I don't think they do understand. The captive population right now is really limited on space. How many wolves get the opportunity to breed is based on how many pups we think we can handle in the upcoming years. The Wolf Center has been lucky enough to, to have wolves born at our facility uh, a few times. However, it does create problems when we're not releasing wolves into the wild. It can actually impact pup survival. It can impact litter size. All major implications if you're trying to build a population. One of our Mexican wolves just left our center last fall and was slated for release in northern Mexico once he and his, his uh, mate had pups. And they were confirmed as pregnant. Ah, success. <laughs> see, and there's some movement right there, which is the heartbeat, just so you can see it. They're at the holding facility in northern Mexico called La Mesa, and then there were no pups. So they're still in captivity, hopefully to be released soon. Um, the other two were released. One was released into Arizona in 2006, and the other was in, in 2008. And sadly, both of those wolves were illegally shot and killed just months after their release. So, a couple of years back, my dad, Aaron, and I were out um, camping along the Black River. And out in this little um, field, 
we saw a juvenile Mexican gray wolf and he was just out there really joyful and just running around the field and just amazing to see. Yeah. A week or so later, we found out that that wolf had been shot and killed and it was devastating, particularly for my kids. After having that personal connection with the wolves, it was a sense of loss. You know, it was a loss for all of us. They're brothers of four legged. When we see the wolves in our eyes, it's like we see ourselves. As a native Pueblo, that's how I see myself as him. Because he is a part of me, you know, and he'll always be a part of me. You know, just to hear the them howl to their to their spirits or their way of praying when they howl you know or their way of greeting their own spirits out there you know so when you're getting ready to do a reintroduction project you don't want to release wolves that are uh, habituated to people. So we built uh, a couple pre-release facilities that are, there are two that are managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the Ladder Ranch is one of them, which is where we are today. And uh, we brought the animals in to, to kind of retain their wildness as best as possible by reducing the amount of human exposure they receive. Currently we have six wolves on the Ladder Ranch. If it's a wolf feeding day, uh, I would get the wolf food ready and then go up to the facility that's about a two mile drive on an ATV from here. And I would go into one pen after the other and check the water and then leave food for the wolves once or twice a week. Uh, we don't ever feed livestock. We feed like elk, which is their preferred diet, and uh, deer. I try and make sure that I get a visual on every wolf I have in the facility. Uh, just to make sure that I don't see any obvious injuries or anything else. And this is important because we, as a pre-release facility, have minimal contacts with the wolves. We really only see them during feedings. Uh, pre-release facilities are uh, like a halfway house between the wild and captivity. We keep uh, wolves that are slated for uh, being released in the wild or uh, we also have some wolves that needed to be removed from the wild from, for one reason or another uh, and uh, had to be placed in captivity. The male wolf uh, that we recently brought in had a removal order because he and his alpha female mate uh, were implicated in livestock depredations. He was darted from a helicopter uh, and then was transported to the facility here. The good thing about uh, him being in captivity now is that he can be put on the co semen collection route. M795 being a pure McBride lineage Mexican gray wolf uh, is a great candidate for having his semen collected and stored uh, so that it can be used in the future. Uh, 
Uh, he will be captured here at the facility and then will be placed on a commercial flight to New York. The two wolves that are in this particular pen are named the Coronado Pack. These two wolves show very typical behavior uh, of a wolf that we consider uh, behaviorally adequate for release. Uh, they will stay away from us as much as they can and either hide or try and run. They are slated for release uh, next spring. A lot of the behavioral evaluations we do are, is really to look at their fear of humans before genetically it's selected for release to the wild. If it passes the test, so to speak, then we may breed them in captivity and then release them with pups. So actually a lot goes into getting an animal into the wild population, several years per animal. Mexican wolves are facing a very significant challenge in that they have very real genetic crisis. There are only three genetic lineages remaining, McBride, Aragon, and Ghost Ranch. At present, the McBride lineage is significantly overrepresented in the wild. It's imperative to, to recreate as much genetic diversity as possible. And the degree of diversity that's necessary to ensure a future for these Mexican wolves cannot be achieved in captivity alone. When reintroductions first began in 1998, you know, we didn't know if they would be successful or not. So we looked at the captive breeding population and we took the most uh, redundant or overrepresented animals from that population and released them to the wild because it wouldn't be a loss to the captive breeding program if those animals didn't survive. That's another little male. The one he's smaller. Yeah, he's got a nice to solve the problem of overrepresentation of the McBride lineage DNA, no, not on the, way the over U.S. There. Fish and Wildlife Service has begun cross fostering pups in the wild. Young pups with different DNA lineage are removed from captive born bay. litters and relocated into a den in the wild with a litter of similar age. Since they will be raised by their wild family, they will have a greater natural fear of humans. When the pups are grown, they will form new packs, mixing their DNA with the wild population. However, cross-fostering is a timely process and not all the pups survive. It is far more beneficial to release a genetically suitable breeding pair directly into the wild. We are taking a male from the wild and a female from captivity. We're going to place them in a pen. Um, they'll have a howdy period where they uh, are introduced through a fence and then we'll put them together, see if they breed and go to the wild. To ensure a future for these wolves is to establish multiple populations on the landscape in sufficient enough of size to ensure that they can withstand uh, environmental challenges like disease or high rates of illegal killing. Animals like wolves, they require large areas for their populations. And then we need large areas to support those. So one of the concepts that we talk about in restoring nature is the need for wildlife corridors. What we mean by corridors are broad swaths of suitable wildlife habitat that allow animals that require large areas to move between one large block of habitat to another. So the area behind me, for example, is thousands of acres. I would expect this area to support maybe two or three packs of wolves. And that's a very small start toward a ecologically and uh, 
biologically vi viable population of wolves. In other words, a population that small would be very uh, extremely susceptible to extinction at any given time. It's been proposed by a group of scientists that we need to establish at least two more populations of Mexican wolves to the north. One would be in the Grand Canyon region. If one population gets low or even goes extinct, wolves, wolves can move uh, through these corridors and repopulate uh, those areas that became, say, temporarily extinct. There's a, uh, there's a pack of wolves called the Middle Fork Pack uh, where uh, both the adult wolves have lost a leg one to a trap and one to a, sh to a gunshot. And they've been returned back to the wild and they're one of the most productive uh, packs of wolves we have in the wild now. They raise a number of puppies even though they've only got three legs each. And it's become an icon of their, of their incredible willingness to survive no matter what us humans do to these wolves. We are in the headwaters of Indian Creek. Uh, just north of the Gila Wilderness, and uh, we spent the night out hoping that we would hear the howls of the Middle Fork Pack. <laughs> and we woke up a couple times to coyotes howling and beautiful elk bugling and it was one moment that I thought it was perhaps the Middle Fork wolves howling, but wishful thinking on my part. Any night on the heel is a beautiful night, so. It's a little chilly still. We've already had a, a raven serenade us this morning, and the sun's rays are starting to warm us up here. And we're gonna go for another little hike, and who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and see the Middle Fork Wolves. Yeah, I mean, there was another one there. We've seen the wolf tracks now, and there's elk tracks everywhere. This is the Middle Fork Pack. Love with the spirit that is wild. Love with the spirit that is From up top of the mountains here, you can get a good overview of all of wolf country, the paradise and hawk's nest pack territories down south to blue stem and rim, and then over to the maverick pack territories. You can get a 360 degree view of you know, the world we live in, and the center of my world. You know, this is where most of our work occurs. In that pack territory this year, we have three current coexistence programs with ranchers that reduce conflicts between wolves and cattle, particularly. Our principal mission in the Southwest is focused on wolf restoration and the ecological restoration that accompanies wolf recovery. What we're looking at here is turbo fladry because it's reinforced with an electric wire. The dangling flags, when they flap in the wind, combined with the electric pulse, are intended as a deterrent to keep wolves and bears and coyotes away from cattle. Wolves are reluctant to cross a line of these dangling flags. Uh, they've been remarkably successful in deterring wolf depredation as well as reducing losses to bear and coyotes and other predators. Uh, in this case, we're right in the heart of the Paradise Pack territory, and they move from forest lands, which we're currently on, onto White Mountain Apache tribal lands off behind me. Last night we stayed up here on the northern boundary of the Fort Apache Reservation, and today we're going to head out over this area, uh, just northeast of Big Lake. We're going to go meet with a rancher who's working with us on a range rider project. 
in an area where there are wolves and talk a little bit about the expectations, uh, roles and responsibilities of a range rider and different steps you can take to try to minimize conflicts between wolves and cattle. Hawk's Nest Pack is one of the longest surviving packs in the history of the program. Established in 1998 through reintroductions and survived up until fall of 2012 when the alpha male was shot. You know, Hawk's Nest Pack had previously denned up over here in that cliff above the drainage in what is arguably one of the most beautiful places in western North America. So clearly wolves move up and down through this drainage which illustrates why it's so important to have a range rider. definitely love my cattle. The more I'm with them, the more I realize they're just gentle and kind. I have cows that are sometimes 15, 13. As long as they're doing well, and even some that aren't doing well, we'll try to take care of them. So I feel like they've given me a lot, and even with bulls I'll do this. I think he's given me his whole life, so he gets to, you know, spend his last years out here. We've been wor working with having a range rider for about eight years. Honestly, it's been a good program for us. Craig has always contacted me and tried to help me in any way he could. So I think without the range rider program, I think a lot of people would have resentment toward the wolves. But on the Arizona side, all of us have worked really hard to work together with the wolf people and us as a team. We just got back from Oklahoma came to help build fence and she asked me if I wanted a job, so. Yeah, I'll put a trailer out here and live for the summer and ride around, fix fence, check on the roofs. Hopefully I see one. The range riding definitely helped. They check a lot of times where the wolf packs are. I think without the range riders here, it would be a lot different scenario as far as the wolves and the cattle intermixing. The man that works for me here, he's seen a wolf, I think, once in eight years, and I've seen a wolf once in eight years. Last night, we took out a little howling receiver. It's a par parabola where you can pick up a sound like two miles, hat, miles away. Right? I could uh, probably give you one of those. We love our cattle the same as they love the wolves, and so there's got to be a way we can make it work. The Paseo del Lobo is a 400 mile long relay hike in order to bring people out into Mexican wolf habitat and hike a path that would be a natural dispersal corridor for wolves traveling from the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area in the White Mountains of Arizona to the south rim of the Grand Canyon where we are trying to bring the Mexican wolf back. We start the hike in Alpine, Arizona. We actually pass through three different territories of wolf packs in the Blue Range. The Mogollon Ram. There have been several wolves in the last 10 to 15 years that have actually come up to the Flagstaff area on their own. Learn some more about what's going on with the wolves. Um, so all different kinds of people are invited uh, and school groups and, group, and learn about and Mexican wolves, how there. important they are to the ecosystem, how endangered they are. Right through here. And hopefully that experience will translate into action and care for the wolves. You know, it's really exciting to be here at Paseo de Lobo. I'm hoping that we will hear the echoes of wild wolves. Uh, on, these, on these mountains for years to come. Oh, yesterday was quite nice. We had a, a hike through a beautiful meadow. We observed a small pup. No 
know, the energy level, you know, just elevated tenfold and people were scrambling to get their cameras and binoculars out of their pack and, you know. <laughs> Every part of the hike has been a learning experience. I, my heart is just filled with so much appreciation of nature and the Mexican gray wolf as my family originated from Mexico. I'm up here both as a participant, uh, like everybody else, and I'm helping with tracking workshops. We should be going out this morning and actually going to a place where, there, where we found wolf tracks yesterday. If you see a track, you've likely walked over several of them already. You need to walk slowly. You want to listen, look through the trees, and see if you see motion, and that will tell you that there's an animal there. Down here, and I'm not sure what it is. I went left. He, he went left. He went left. He's back behind the trees. I, I just saw one a few minutes ago, so if you count that wolf as well as all the others, I'm, I think I'm up to 44. Some of the wolves I've seen more than once. I'm going to look back. To me, it's always pretty exciting because there really are so few of them, and it takes quite a bit of doing to find them, to see them, to even hear them. And as a result, when you see one, it's a thrill. Lord knows I've been away But I can feel it in my bones This time I'm really coming home Really? Yeah. To me it's not enough that my students come here and look out and are amazed. Um, I want them to also have the opportunity to have the ideas and the science behind this experience. There's a rock-solid opportunity for us to make choices as a, as a species about how we're going to live and which other animals uh, we're going to work for to, to make sure that they ride into the future with us. So we're heading down to the Sevilleta Wolf Management Facility on the Sevilleta National Wildlife Refuge. It's around an hour and a half south of Albuquerque. And we're going to capture a female wolf and do a quick physical exam, vaccinations, dewormer, and crate her and transport her to the Ladder Ranch Wolf Management Facility. We're shuffling wolves around a little bit to make room for some incoming animals. This wolf we're handling today is an older wolf. She's over 10, and she was in the wild. I do a lot of blood screening. I do a lot of stool screening. I have found very little disease, both in our captive wolves as well as in our wild ones. We visit the facility as infrequently as possible, once or twice a week, to feed and check waters. We don't want them around humans very much. We want them to develop their own social behaviors and pack structures. So my students and I have been coming here for about five or six years and have helped to prepare several wolves to be moved into the wild. The uh, spot that we are in is already behind several locked gates and miles of empty space. So this is an area that's closed to the public. So most everything that's done here is in the interest of keeping a wolf wild. So, um, wherever we are, we want to make sure there's either a person standing in this. So we'll be coming in here and helping the Fish and Wildlife move the one wolf into a crate so that it can be transported a couple hundred miles away from here. So let's come on up, let's get in front of that tree, get right next to the fish. 
Guys, this is a gigantic gap right here. She's gonna go right through that bush. Okay. Some of these wolves have been in the wild before and for one reason or another they've been brought back into captivity either for breeding purposes or because they may have um, caused some trouble out on the landscape. I never thought I'd be able in high school to go out in the field and be able to like help capture wolves and stand there and like hold the blood samples. I think for me as a teacher, the opportunity to connect uh, students to real life experiences. This is the opportunity to see and do something that it has real meaning. The uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, allowing volunteer high school students to participate in a program like this where they learn uh, how to safely enter a facility, how to work side by side with professionals. And we have several of our students who've done this over the years who have now gone on to college and studied wildlife and are now working in the conservation field. It gave me a lot of hope and it's awesome that Mr. Shaw teaching all of us what we could do to help our community and native species in New Mexico, especially wolves. It was uh, really interesting to watch, to watch the vet veterinarians work and see how uh, quietly and efficiently they uh, completed their task of uh, subduing and uh, creating the wolf and doing it with the least amount of stress to the wolf. So our tradition every time we come down to Sivilleta is to always read from the San County Almanac and to read the essay, Thinking Like a Mountain by Aldo Leopold. And this really is a, uh, a major piece of conservation writing that has influenced generations now of conservationists, wildlife biologists, and just common citizens who have come to understand that a wolf has every right and every need to be on a mountain as anything else. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and I have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. The Gila ecosystem is considered one of the hot spots for biological diversity in New Mexico. Now that we've put the wolf back, we have mountain lions, we have black bears, we have gray foxes, there are also coyotes. We have one of the rarest birds in New Mexico, which is the Mexican spotted owl. So it's really a uh, quite a diverse ecosystem. In two, the year 2000, the first group of wolves were in, reintroduced into the Gila wilderness, just off the left flank and a little behind Lily Mountain. So we started by going to our facility at the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge. We captured the wolves in their pens there and hauled them down here to the southern edge of the Gila wilderness. We Packed them up, rode about 16 miles into the middle of the wilderness it's on the backs of mules and put the uh, wolves in a pen that was built on top of a hill. 
Our crew had built the pen made out of nylon mesh so that the wolves could actually chew their own way out. I was sitting in my camp that first night watching the sun go down and as it got almost dark, all of a sudden a howl erupted off the hillside right beside my camp. I guess the wolves were probably 50 yards away. As I was watching in the direction of the howl, I saw this just in the last bit of light, a gray shape moving across the land out about 50 yards from my camp. I knew at that moment that the wolves had chewed their way out, and for the, now for the first time in probably 50 years, there were wild wolves again roaming in the Wahila wilderness. And, it was a real special experience for me to be the person there to witness that. And we're preparing to take a group of eco-tourists on a trip into the Gila wilderness. It's a benefit for the New Mexico Wilderness Alliance. And we're here on the theme of wolves. Uh, this area is now home to reintroduced Mexican wolves. A new group of wolves was released here about 12 miles or so within the last few weeks. We saw this advertised in January and we said this is our goal, this is why we're doing this, because we want to go on that trip, the wolf trip in the Gila with the New Mexico Wilderness Alliance and Dave Parsons and so, um, you know, just very thrilled and excited that it's finally here, today's the day. <laughs> we're with the world's leading expert, David Parsons, I've heard so much about him. So I'm hoping that we can hear one at least and if we run into one, all the better. Well, my role is, I guess you'd say I'm a guide. These are our most beautiful and special and rare places. These are our reservoirs of diversity. It is so important that we save these wild places. If I saw a wolf, I would just experience awe and rareness of seeing or hearing that creature in the wild. I think I think I would just be so very happy. I'm helping Nick out with the wolf program. We're starting a small outfitter business. I enjoy going on wolf trips. You meet new people. People are more interested in native diversity and, and the natural historical part of what the Gila country is all about. Well, the way this trip works is that we hire packers who come in with a string of horses and mules and they pack all of the heavy stuff. They set up a camp in a beautiful meadow right next to the middle fork of the Gila River. We camp there for three nights. We'll have meals together. We'll go out on day hikes to various places. We'll be talking about a lot of things on this trip that relate to wolves and the restoration of wild nature to the importance of wild habitat. Our greatest hope is to either see a wolf, which is a pretty rare opportunity, but we might well hear wolves at night if we're quiet in our camp. That's good, thank oh, you. What this trip represents is the early beginnings of ecotourism in this region based on the presence of the wolf. And the more wolves that we can put in this area, the better the opportunity would be for ecotourists. Wolves are an odd critter. People either love them or they hate them, but there's a whole lot more people that love them than don't. And uh, they uh, are interested in coming out now that we have wolves in the area to experience that. The wolf belongs out here. This is its home. 
we came into its home and exterminated it. And the wolf deserves to be here again. And it's our duty as the species that exterminated this animal to do that wrong or right and bring it back here to the wild. The uh, wolves don't need humans and the, the earth doesn't need humans. But we need this earth and we need to care for it in a way that sustains wolves, that sustains the biosphere across generations and generations. Someday, the wolves will just be part of our culture. We'll have them in our songs, in our music, in our dances, in our artwork. And then we'll learn how to coexist with them. It's really up to us to educate and motivate the public to act on behalf of wolves and wild nature. The good work of hundreds of dedicated volunteers and activists across the country have preserved a future for Mexican wolves. Just the fact that uh, Mexican gray wolves are here just give another whole aspect of beauty and wildness to everything. I've come to really love and embrace the exciting changes the wolf represents for the West. Oh, I love the wolves. <laughs> I want to see one behind me. If I could hear them talking, I think they would be saying, ah, ah, joy, wonder. It's miraculous to be alive. If you want to see something rare, find its tracks, hear the animal howl, this is the place to do it. Maybe you will be lucky enough and say, I saw the rarest wolf in the world. Don't let a species get down to single digits. It is really hard uh, to recover these guys. They are North America's most endangered gray wolf. It's our duty ecologically and ethically to do what we can to give them a second chance. I hope that science prevails. It's only us who love wild things, who care for wild things, who want to hear the howl of a wolf, who want to know that wolves are wild and free from Durango in Mexico to Durango in Colorado, from the Grand Canyon of the Colorado in Arizona to the Grand Canyon of the Copper Canyon in Mexico. Well, I see the world when I grow up to be a good, well-environmented, non-trash place and like to see it with wolves to make sure that it stays a good earth. When wolves simply become a part of the landscape out here again, raising their young, finding prey, and living and dying out here, and everybody accepts them as a part of the ecosystem just as they accept the deer and the bear and the lion, then to me we'll have achieved success. And the experience of hearing a wolf howl in the night in the wild is, I just have a sense that the, that the world is right, that the ecosystem is intact, that all is right, you know, with nature. I am Wolf, a Mexican gray wolf. I am a keystone species that keeps nature's beauty in perfect harmony. I am the river and the forest, the mysterious and the magnificent. I speak for all wolves, as we have a deep and inherent communication with nature and all its inhabitants. At night our spirits sing, soaring with the winds above the mountains and the trees. When we sing, our songs can be heard across lakes and throughout forests. Stand still, be quiet, and feel our presence.
Ooh. 